Well, good Pentecost Sunday morning. I'm glad you're here with us this week. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We ask that your spirit would settle down on us at this time. And Lord, you would give me the ability to speak your words in ways that I don't have. That, Lord, I would be able to preach your words to our hearts, not my own words. Hide me behind the cross, and may they see you and you only this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the title of my sermon this morning is Perilous Times Call for Powerful Methods. We're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, um, with a few other verses here and there. Uh, you could also look at Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 13. We're not going to go there this morning, um, but it's also a reference point. Make sure that you get verse 13. It's important. It covers the whole first 12 verses. Uh, it's the it's the focal point, as it were, but we won't cover that this morning. But for your own study, please go there. We are living in perilous times, are we not? <laughs> so let's just see if Second Timothy chapter three sounds very any familiar. Second Timothy chapter three verse one says, "But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud." blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. That sounds pretty fitting, doesn't it? Uh, if you looked at last week's news at all, I think you could see this all over the pages, all over the websites, all over the TV screen. I mean, we know evil people do evil things, right? Sinners are going to sin. It's kind of unfortunate when we go to read our Bibles, um, when we have chapters and verses to delineate um, between phrases, a lot of times when we read through them and we have chapter and verse, we miss paragraphs, we miss train of thoughts, we miss connections. Sometimes even the sentences themselves get cut apart into verses. And you notice here, um, 2 Timothy chapter 3, it's essentially a run-on sentence and it's got four verses that you have here, which actually it has five. I left the verse 5 out for emphasis sake. It's kind of sad. But as we look at this, we see a, a pretty extensive list of some bad things happening, don't we? Blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. I mean, the list goes on and on. But notice verse 4 doesn't end with a period. It ends with a comma. I'm not going to get political here. But I do want to use this last week's headlines as proof that we are living in perilous times. We can't stop evil people from doing evil things, no matter how hard we try. It's impossible unless you lock them in solitary confinement, and even then they hang themselves with fingerprints around their neck, right? We look at last week's news whether it be a police officer that was in the wrong or a whole city's just collapsing into chaos. Evil people are going to do evil things. We can't stop that. As we look at our nation, we kind of wonder, is our nation at the point of no return? People, we can't say that. If we say that our nation's at the point of no return, we have now denied the power of God in the lives of men and women. But here's the scary part. The scariest part of 2 Timothy chapter 3 is not verses 1 through 4. It's the fifth. The it goes through that terrible long list and then it says, verse 5, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And from such people turn away. This message wasn't to the sinners. This message was to the church. 
This was Paul telling his protege that when you go into these churches, you're going to see this in the last days, in these perilous times. You're going to see this whole list of awful, and it's going to be inside the church. They have all of these things wrong with them, having a form of godliness. They think they're right. They think they're going to make it. But they deny the power of God. I held the verse back for emphasis because you at first glance would just say, well, yeah, those awful sinners, they made their beds, let them lay there. Our nation's at a point of no return. But really, people, the church may be at the point of no return. Oh, pastor, no, the church is, is going to make it. We always do. We always pull through. But maybe the church is at the point of no return. Unless we are filled and moved by God's Spirit, we are in terrible terrible shape we're moving to a precipice that we can't hit the brakes from at some point we're going to be like Thelma and Louise in that car and no matter if we want to hit the brakes or not we're still going over the cliff and Paul isn't talking to the sinners he's talking to the church in these perilous times church we need the move of god we need the spirit of god to shake us up we need to have god at work inside of us inside of our families inside of our church members the only solution for our current problem is god intervening in the lives of his followers that's the only hope we have in these perilous times. So what does the church, or excuse me, what does the Holy Spirit do in lives? Oh, sorry, I got ahead of myself. Has God changed? Is God the problem? In these perilous times, has God just stopped working? James 1.17 Every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation in shadow of turning. With whom there is no variation in shadow of turning. He hasn't moved. He hasn't changed. Not even a shadow. Hebrews 3, 8 and 9. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines that might tell you otherwise. Dan Miller's paraphrase. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Don't listen to the ideas that God's not at work, that God has slowed down. In fact, let's hear it from God himself. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. In other words, I'm the Lord God, I don't change, and the only reason you're not cooked right now, you're not burning in hell, is because I haven't changed. I hold you in the palm of my hand. If he hasn't changed, it can't be his problem. It's got to be ours. So what does the Holy Spirit do in our lives? What is the work of the Holy Spirit? And I've got a whole list. It's not an extensive list. You need to do your search. All I did was typed in the Holy Spirit, and I went down through the verses, 109 of them, I think, in the New King James, and just kind of defined what the Holy Spirit does. And like I said, this is not exhaustive. It just picked a few. God gives us supernatural strength. The whole story of Samson is that way. How about Daniel 5.11? He, Daniel, was found to have insight, intelligence, and wisdom like that of the gods. The Babylonians couldn't understand it. We do because the Holy Spirit was in Daniel's life. The Holy Spirit, Matthew 1.18, impregnates you. Ask Mary. The Holy Spirit, the whole reason we have Jesus is because the Holy Spirit impregnated Mary. Don't worry. It only happened once. It will only happen once. It's not going to happen again. But God does do miracles in us and through us, doesn't he? It's by the Spirit 
in us, impregnating us, or in filling us. You go through the whole birth story, Luke chapter 1 and 2, Mary, Elizabeth, Zachariah, Simeon, all of these people, it says they were filled with the Holy Spirit, or being filled with the Holy Spirit. So, technically, yeah, the Holy Spirit impregnates us, lives inside of us, maybe starts out as just something small, but grows into something great, large. He infills us. He gives us the words to say, Luke chapter 12, 12, Mark 12, 36. He speaks through us. He gives us the words, and then he says what he wants to say, Acts 1, 16. You can also go to many other passages that say the same thing. The Holy Spirit guides us. Luke chapter 4, Jesus was led into his temptation. Ooh, that's a little scary, isn't it? Jesus was led into his temptation by the Holy Spirit. Makes us joyful. Luke chapter 10, verse 21. Will teach you all things and remind you of his words. John 14, 26. Testifies of Jesus. John 15, 26. Gives us power. Acts 1, 8. Gives us the ability to speak in other languages. That happened on Pentecost Day, right? That we celebrate today. Acts chapter 2, verse 4. Helps us to see in the spiritual realm. Stephen, as he's getting stoned, being filled with the Spirit, looks up and he sees the throne of God, the spiritual realm. Acts chapter 7, verse 55. The Holy Spirit encourages us. Acts 9, 31. Gives us a job to do. Acts chapter 13, verse 2. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19. Gives the church unity and fellowship, 2 Corinthians 13, 14. Produces fruit in us, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, right? It produces in us. This is an awesome verse. 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. The Holy Spirit is a witness in heaven. So I want to ask you the question, are these things growing in your life? Are they being produced? I didn't ask that you had all of these in perfection. I didn't ask if at one time you had all of these things. I also didn't ask if you had all of these things, whether at one time in the past or now in the present. But are these things growing in your life? The work of the Holy Spirit, is it at work? Is it growing in your life? People need this. Church, we need the infilling of the Spirit. We need God to take over. We need God to empower us. We need God to fill us. In these perilous times, if we don't have the Spirit at work and growing in our life, we don't stand a chance. We may very well be at the point of no return. To be God's ambassadors, to be his salt and light, to be David to Mephibosheth, to be Philip to the... Uh, Ethiopian eunuch, to be, fall, to be Paul, to Festus, to be Daniel, to the Babylonians, to be even Samson, to the Philistines, we have to have the filling of the Holy Spirit. We need to feel the Holy Spirit's power flowing through us, just as it did on Pentecost Day, the first one. If God hasn't changed, he's not the problem. We are. Isaiah 63, verse 10, kind of says it pretty soundly. It says, we have grieved the Holy Spirit by rebellion, and now God is fighting against us. We have grieved his Holy Spirit because we've been disobedient, because we've been in rebellion. We haven't wanted to give him all. Now God fights against us. Have you been missing out? 
I want to give you great news. The Holy Spirit's filling, the power of the Holy Spirit, it's a gift. Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39. Then Peter said to them, and I say to you this morning, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Here's the great news. The gift and the filling of the Holy Spirit, it's a gift. You don't have to earn it. You can't earn it. You don't have to work for it. You can't work for it. If you repent and you are baptized into the name of Jesus Christ, you turn your life around, you've been forgiven of your sins, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's given to you. But are you missing out? See, the crazy thing about a gift is, a gift can be given, and it can also be rejected. I remember my dad told me a story one time when he was at school. One of his professors wanted to bless him and was going to buy him a suit. But my dad was too proud. And he wouldn't accept the suit. The gift was given. The, the suit was going to be paid for. But in my dad being proud to not take the gift, for many reasons. It wasn't just because he didn't want to receive from them, but he didn't want to be a burden to them. But in that, he rejected the gift, and he didn't get the suit. And man, I saw the pictures of my dad's suits. Hmm, 60s were a wild time. A gift can be given, but it can be rejected. A gift can also be given, received, and then not used. How many of you at Christmas time, they don't do it much anymore because everybody hates them now, but how many of you received a fruitcake and it sat there and it sat there and it sat there and it was almost a contest to see how long it would last before you could throw it away, right? I remember as a kid, I'm not going to say who gave them because I don't remember and I don't want to hurt their feelings, but I remember fruitcakes set on the counter of our house for a long time because I didn't like them either. A gift can be received and not used. God can empower us. God can do great things in us. But you remember what he told the disciples? Wait around the city until you receive power. I don't know about you, but I'm a go-to and I'm going to get it done. And I'm not going to wait around. I gotta. I, there's things to be done. And so I don't wait around for the Spirit's empowerment. I pull myself up by my own bootstraps. I'm an American, right? Whose power is greater? Mine at my very best? Or God's at his weakest? Every time it's God. He can give you the gift, but if you don't use the gift because you want to do it yourself or you don't want to wait around or you don't want to give him reign of your heart, you're missing out on the beautiful gift. Gifts can be given and rejected. Gifts can be received and not used. Gifts can also be received and used improperly. We've seen that a lot, haven't we? Oh, they call them hypocrites. They call them charlatans. They use what God is telling them to tell others for them. You're not listening to God, but God gave me a message for you, and you need to hear it, and you need to obey it. Well, if it was that important to God for me to hear it, why didn't he just tell me? And I'm not saying, please don't understand. Please don't misunderstand me. There are times when God uses those people and he gives those gifts to people. But there's also times when those gifts are used improperly and the gift is wasted. The gift is no longer for the glory of God, but the glory of ourselves. 
Are we missing out on God's gift? Have we silenced the Spirit's work, His healing, His prophesying, His empower, empowering, His wisdom, His understanding? Have we had a form of godliness, but we've rejected the power because we might be impatient or we might not like how the Spirit might do it or we don't want to give Him full reign, we're kind of scared what He might do with us? Have we quenched, have we quenched the Spirit's moving and power and infilling because of our actions? Maybe our sinful actions. Maybe by our unsurrendered heart. To have God's filling means there can't be anything else there. It, may, it, can't, it means that there can't be someone fighting against God. History tells us during the Napoleonic Wars, Lord Byron Nelson had defeated a French uh, admiral. The French admiral pulls his boat up alongside Lord Nelson and comes across the plank and descends towards Lord Nelson, smiling the whole time. He held out his hand to the victor. Lord Nelson made no response, didn't lift his hand, didn't say anything, but quietly said, Sir, your sword first. Laying down the sword first was the visible token of surrender. When we allow anything to fight against God and the war takes place, there can't be any filling. There can't be any power because he's, he's using up the power to fight against the enemy. And in our rebellion, we are the enemy. Oh, this should scare us. I don't know if you've ever heard the story of Sir John Ramsden in, Huddle, in Huddersfield, England. But just before the Industrial Revolution, Sir Ramsden saw this little town of Huddersfield as a destination for industry. It was close to Yorkshire, and he knew it was going to boom. And the property values were going to skyrocket. He was going to buy them and do great with them. So what he did was he quietly started buying up these properties until finally he owned every piece of property in Huddersfield except for one small cottage and garden owned by an old Quaker. Mr. Ramsden, Sir Ramsden, he tried everything he could. He sent people, he sent proposals, he sent offers to that old Quaker time and time again and nothing, no one could close the deal. Finally, he decided that he would go himself and he would use his power in person to seal the deal. So the usual courtesies passed in the conversation and finally Sir Ramsden said to the Quaker, well, I'm pretty sure you know why I'm here, don't you? And the Quaker said, yes, I've heard that you've bought the whole town except for this little cottage and garden. I've been bombarded <laughs> by your agents trying to buy this property from me. But I just don't want to sell. The cottage was built for my own convenience. The garden is made just the way I like it. Why should I sell? So Sir Ramsden said, well, sir, I'm prepared to make you a very generous offer. I will put a gold sovereign covering every inch of ground on this cottage and garden if you will just sell it to me <laughs> sir john was positive the guy was going to take the offer it was so much more than the property was worth but then he'd own the entire town he said well are you going to sell <laughs> the old quaker with a smile on his face said no not unless you turn all those gold sovereigns on edge well, that was, there was no way he could do that. The offer was already more than the property was worth. 
defeated, the knight rose to leave. And as he was walking away, the Quaker said, Remember, Sir John, that Huddersfield belongs to you and me. If we allow Satan to keep even the smallest parcel of our heart, he can always say, Remember, God, this heart belongs to you and me. He may be a Christian, but I have control of part of his life. Where Christ is not Lord in practice, life becomes a battleground of conflicting interests, and you will never have the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. It takes complete and absolute surrender, not allowing Satan to have any foothold at all. To not own one grain of sand in the heart of your life. In these perilous times, we need the infilling of the Spirit. We need the power of the Spirit flowing through us. We need the gifts of the Spirit growing in our lives. And the only way to get that is to give up. Let him own the whole town. Let him sanctify you wholly and empower you far beyond what you are on your own. As you ponder your life, your heart, and who owns it, I ask that you would ask God that he might reveal to you any place, any parcel of ground, that doesn't belong to him. Surrender it. Whether it's the good of your life or whether it's the bad, surrender it all to him. And then ask him to fill you with his Holy Spirit, to produce in you power by his Spirit, and that the fruit of the Spirit would flourish and produce fruit in your life. May God bless you.